So if you've, well, not last week because I wasn't here, but week before that, um, we were continuing kind of walking through the book of Galatians, and we're going to keep that up this morning. Uh, so as we walk through this, we're starting into chapter 3 this week, and we're going to, well, depending on how time goes, we're going to spill into chapter 4 a little bit here, so that's the plan anyway. So we're going to look at a few main points here together this morning, and the first, let me just open in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into this. So Heavenly Father... Again, I thank you for this morning, our opportunity to gather together and look at your word and just thank you that you've given us uh, your word through this, these revelations in the Bible. Just ask you to be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Galatians 3, verse 1, starts with, O foolish Galatians. So, you fools, right? So Paul's starting this, he's not pulling any punches, and if you remember at the end of chapter 2, he's already made these statements about kind of why they should believe him, and, you know, he, he backed it up with his calling that was given to him by Jesus, to the gospel message he preached, his interactions with the apostles, and, you know, reinforcing the message he's preaching, and even confronting Peter on some things. So that's kind of what we've, we've worked through so far. So he comes up with, you know, this idea of um, we're justified by our faith. You should listen to me. And then starts right with, oh, foolish Galatians. So he's kind of, you know, he's built up to this point, and now he's getting into the start of the meat of what he's trying to tell them. So let's read this together. If you have a Bible, it's probably easier to read than that, but we'll do what we can. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? For it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul brings out this question of, well, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Right, talking about this, you're justified by your faith, not by the works, not by the law, not by the circumcision. Um, But how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive it by some work of your own doing or by hearing with faith, right? And it's one of the easiest traps we can put ourselves into as well. So we can be on board with that, you know, the fact that there's salvation in Christ, and then we can have a hard time believing that that's enough, right? Well, what else do we need to do? What what else is there? And, you know, it's not, (coughs) we need to stay out of the, say, the ditch on the other side of, you know, Okay, I, I have faith, I'm, I'm saved, I don't need to do anything else, right? Like, let's, <laughs> salvation by faith alone, and then there is works, we will see later in Galatians as well, that comes out of that. But, there, you know, that's a result, not a, not a prerequisite for the salvation. So, <clears throat> for me, like, when I think about the hymn, and I like old hymns, because I'm old, we talked about that this morning, <laughs> So, we talk about the hymn, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, okay? I'm not going to sing it, so you don't have to leave. Um, But we can say these things with our words and believe them in our minds, but then feel something is missing, okay? It kind of goes along the lines of one point, you know, what can wash away my sin? What is it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? And we can say that and believe it and still say, well, I need to do something or, you know, this as well. So nothing but the blood can do this, but then I need to do this. And there's two ways that you can take this phrase, at least that I, that I come up with, of that nothing but the blood of Jesus. And it's, it has truth both ways. And 
it's funny because depending on, I won't say the, okay, I'll say it in, the theological pendulum, wh- where you're, you're going on this swing at the moment, or in Christianity as a whole, you, you kind of follow one of these ones more easily than the other. So the first one is, okay, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's nothing else that was enough to save us, okay? There was nothing else that would be enough. The law wouldn't do it, um, because if it could have saved us from chapter 2, we we wouldn't need Christ to die for us, okay? We've we've looked at that. And if we could have done it on our own just by being good enough, then we wouldn't need Christ to die for us. Nothing else is powerful enough to justify us and allow us to be restored in that relationship with God. And, And to do away with that separation that sin brought in, so, so that's the one way. And hopefully we can get on board with that. The second way we can take it is that nothing else is needed as well. Nothing but the blood, right? So nothing was, else was enough, and nothing but the blood is required. It is finished. He finished it. Everything that was required to enable us to have a restored relationship with God is completed by Jesus. Okay? So that's... I like just even the, the phrasing in that hymn because it kind of hits both of those as it goes through. So if we look back at this passage here, people, churches in Galatia, they're called out for flawed logic, right? Or foolishness. As Paul walks them through kind of their own logic, their own process of when they started becoming Christians by faith, and then how to perfect this faith by adding things in the flesh, right? But you didn't start that way. Why do you think it's going to make it better? It doesn't make any sense. And in the context that we, we started in from chapter 2, we can really see the main issue they're talking about was, was adding circumcision onto the Gentiles as well. So once the Gentiles were becoming Christians, following Christ, then some were saying circumcision is required as well. And that can apply to many things in our our life as well, uh, even present day. So one that comes up frequently that I see is is baptism, actually, right? And as part of a Baptist denomination, I have some feelings about this. And one of the main things we talk about with anyone who approaches the board wanting to be baptized is the question on, what does it do? Right? Why do you get baptized? What is that accomplishing for you? Because there is some places that teach baptism is required for salvation. Right? There are some denominations that do that, and those tend to be ones where you'll see them doing things like baptizing babies so that they are able to be saved. Like That kind of logic flows in naturally. If, if this is required, well, let's get that done with. Um, and... So we'll believe there is a saving baptism, but that one is invisible, and it's baptism by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you when you put your faith in Jesus. So, you know, there is that one. You you didn't necessarily get wet with that one, right? But you're filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit, you might say. And then the baptism by immersion is what we do as a public declaration public demonstration or an outward step of obedience of what the Holy Spirit has already done for you. Okay? The, the water doesn't save you, but it's a sign of you being joined with Christ, trying to obediently follow in His footsteps. So Jesus saves you, and that was it. And now we're following Him. We're following in that baptism. We're kind of joining ourselves to Him publicly in that process. So, you can see how that one can get skewed a bit as well. And, I don't know, I shouldn't say it, but I, I like one of the songs Randy Travis has of, you know, Pray for the Fish, because the guy was really, you know, he was a bad dude, and he got baptized, and the water's boiling, and the fish is... Theologically, it's really bad, but it's a fun song. So that, we're not going to do, we're not going to do that, but that is one of those things that migrates in to, you know, different, different religions of, well, let's add to this. Well, you can, you know, you need this baptism in water to be saved and we we clarify that with people who want to be baptized that's one of the that's one of the things we mainly talk about what is this doing for you 
Um, and I know for, there was one uh, older gentleman years ago who uh, he wanted to be baptized and it, it was kind of, he was thinking along that lines if I needed this. And was able to actually share with him, like, no, you, you can have assurance in your salvation now. Right? You don't need to go and be baptized to have assurance of your salvation. But it's a step of obedience. And it was actually kind of nice to see, like, it, almost like a weight was lifted off of him of, well, I don't need to do this for it to be done, but I want to do it because of this reason, right? And, and to explain that, um, I mean, it stuck with me for quite a while. So. And so Jesus saves you, n- nothing else. And Jesus saves you just as he saved Abraham. As we continue here, verse 6 to 9. So it says, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted him as righteousness. Know then that this is the faith, or know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles in faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham and the man of faith. So, we'll leave that up there. As Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. And yet, we're looking at this in, you know, it's Paul's explaining this much later than Abraham's time. Um, So let's take a look back at the original context of this as well. Because it helps to get some of the interaction in here. And I think I put it up here. Yeah, that one's going to be small to read, so hopefully you have a Bible. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. And at this point, he's still called Abram, because this is a little bit earlier in his life. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, but your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and counted it all as righteousness. So, the start of this verse is after all these, after these things, um, we do not have time to look at this this morning. Um, but feel free to go and read that because that's very interesting as well. And it does add a bit to it. Um, but God comes to Abraham in this vision saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. And Abraham responds. And I had the action to spell check this one. But he responds. And what I hear, maybe this is because I'm a grumpy dad, but what I hear is whining or maybe like Eeyore. Okay? Like, you know, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore. What does he say? Because, so again... Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. O Lord, what will you give me? For I am childless. And on and on, right? (coughs) I'm not going to go through it all like that. But you get to see kind of that point. So God reassures Abram that indeed he'll have an heir and that through his heir all nations shall be blessed. But it just strikes me. Like, you know, you get this vision from God about your reward is going to be great. And he's like, what are you going to do for me? I don't have any heirs. Right? What an attitude. But, again, as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. And this is the important part. So God explains, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you an heir. You're going to have all of this. Um, but how does that tie in with what Paul's talking about in Galatians and, and everything, well, it's the next verse, so, you know, spoil sport. 
<coughs> well, next set of verses. Jump down a little bit. Galatians 3, 15 to 18. We're going to get a little bit of context in here. So, I'll read this, and then we have to break it out a little bit to make it make sense. So, to give a human examples, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abram and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So Paul's explaining the reference and is highlighting some key points here, right? So it's, it's nice. Someone's preaching, they might, you know, try and explain, here's what's going on, here's the context that's going in, and, I mean, Paul's doing that for the churches there. So we get to take some advantage of that. So the first one, he starts with, the no covenant, not even a man-made one, nor one given by God, is changed or void, right? It's, <coughs> it's a covenant, and it doesn't have conditions that change. You can't add extra fine print to it later. Okay, that's not how it works, or it's not really a covenant. It's more of a contract at that point, right? It can be altered, it can be reassessed as time passes by. And, you know, this is part of why, like, we'll say, like, marriage is a covenant, right? It's, it's a human example of covenant like God gives a covenant. Unfortunately, I mean, none of us are perfect, and some marriages don't last. But it's that picture of, you're not going to add to it. You're not going to do, you know, the marriage isn't going to be, okay, well, this is for the next, you know, 10 years, and then it's, you know, up for renewal and all that kind of stuff, right? I heard talk about that, but that's, that's not a covenant. This is a promise. This is going to happen, and this is not the same as a contract that's with an employer or a landlord that once time is up, you can just transfer it somewhere else, and it's like that's, that's it, right? This, it's very different. This is not something that once it's made, you, you change it or make it void on, say, on one side or the other. <coughs> Next one is, he makes the point that the offspring that was promised to Abram to be the heir and a blessing to all nations is actually Christ. Okay, so this is a big jump, actually. Especially, I mean, Paul coming from a Jewish perspective and growing up, knowing the law, knowing all of this, that kind of lineage between Abraham and Isaac, like, to basically say that was not the heir that was talking about. That is not how the promise started. But it's really Jesus, right? That would have been a kind of a, a bold thing for him to say coming out of that tradition. And that it was one heir and it would bless all of the nations and that's Christ. And that the law did not extinguish the covenant or disregard it. So when the law was added in, Paul says 430 years later, and even uh, circumcision came in before that, like during Abraham's lifetime, but after this, neither of those things does away with or changes the conditions of what God promised. Okay? God made a promise here. Just because he brings in the law later doesn't mean that that changes the original promise. That promise is still going to come true regardless of what comes after it. And that's what Paul is, is saying in here. Is that Christ is the complete fulfillment of the promise that was made to Abraham way back in Genesis 15. So if the promised inheritance or the gift of salvation needed to be earned, then it wouldn't have been the reward that was promised, right? I'll give you a great reward. Wouldn't be the same thing. So why did God give the law at all then? Do I have that one? I don't have the 
much. But anyway. <coughs> Continuing on, verse 23, it says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to promise. And this is really that emphasis of... <coughs> that the law was given to be a guardian until Christ came, right? To set boundaries, to give oversight, to act like a guardian of a child until the true father returns and raises them up as sons and daughters of God. So Jesus came to redeem us so that we could be adopted into the family of God. So we're no longer captive under that law or under guardianship of the law, but free to be children of God and if we, well, if we continue into here, Paul really completes this uh, in Galatians 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that, me right, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So this is where we see the whole dynamic shift, right? <coughs> Christ came, fulfilled the law, basically gets rid of that guardianship that's around us, allows us to be children of God, adopted as sons, that we can come to God as Father. And because of that, we have all the privileges of His children, and we are heirs through God with Christ. This is a profound statement that he's making here, right? It's, it's turning the whole thing upside down and really separating the, this dynamic of, let's add to this, we've got to make the, you know, the Gentile believers follow those Jewish traditions. And that, he's doing away with all of it. He's saying, it's done. Christ fulfilled all of that. We don't need to add to this. And there is no difference between any of us, right? Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, not male nor female, we were all children of God through Christ. And that's a profound truth that they really needed to hear. And I think our generation needs to be reminded of that as well. So with that, let me just close in prayer here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message this morning that you've given us and the reminder that we're all equal through your Son. He fulfilled the law and he is the promised offspring of Abraham that blesses all nations, that all people can come to you, have that relationship restored. We can be made right with you. We thank you for sending your son to do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen.